Before we pray, would you open your Bible to a book that's going to be very hard for you to find? It's Haggai. When have we ever been to Haggai before? Probably never. But if you'll find the Old Testament, you go to the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi, come back a book that's Zechariah, and one more book behind that is Haggai. You didn't uh, bring a Bible, pull the Pew Bible out. It's page 636. We're just going to read this. Nothing on the screen. I want to read this passage. We'll have a prayer and plunge into our moments together. All right, Haggai chapter 2. Haggai 2. I want to pick it up, please, in verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place... I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Let's pray. Oh, God, there's a time coming, is there, when you will shake the nations? It was a bit shaking just to learn before walking out onto this sanctuary about that tragedy in Pittsburgh this morning in a synagogue. There's a bond between Sabbatarians no matter where they live on the planet. There's a whole lot of shaking going on, Father, in the nations of this earth. What is this that we just read? Something, someone is coming that all the nations will desire? That has to be true. And we know who that someone is. As we worship in the midst of a shaken world, speak to us. We humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you notice that tucked into that rather shaking passage is a single line? I'll put it on the screen for you. If your Bible's still open, you'll see it. It's it's, uh, verse 8. This is God Almighty himself, the Lord of hosts speaking. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord. One translation says, says the Lord of angel armies. It's all mine, the silver and the gold. You know, are you talking to us, God? Because if you are, we're a bunch of Americans here, most of us. Well, we have some Brazilians here. and We have, I guess we have 90 other nations. But you know what? In this country, we do silver and gold just fine. What did you think about our jackpot, the Mega Millions jackpot? That was pretty good, wasn't it? Did you follow that story, by the way? The Mega Millions jackpot, unless you were sleeping. Some... Dear soul, I'm not going to say lucky because you know what? They've done research. They have found that those who win the giant jackpots actually end up, many of them, with tragic, tragic endings. I tell you what, it's not worth having that kind of money. What kind of money are you talking about, Dwight? I guess I slept through that headline. Oh, a little soul down in, uh, what was it, Simpsonville, South Carolina, had the right lineup of numbers and won $1.537 billion, a billion dollars. Anybody here know that kind of money? No, I don't know that kind of number at all, but I'm saying, try me, try me, try me just once, try me. (laughs) Come on, $1.537 billion. Would that be the silver and the gold that God also has? Apparently. Reminds me of that moment when Peter and his bud John, because whenever Peter shows up in the Gospels, you will always see, in the Gospel of John, you will always see John Boy there. They just were buds. They were fishermen. John's young. Peter's a little older, but they hung around together. And this particular afternoon, after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended back to heaven, 3 o'clock. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and you know what? That's the prayer hour, and Peter and John are hustling up the stairway into a gate called Beautiful, and it's beautiful because there is embedded into the facade a a vine with gold and silver grapes, and we've been talking about a vine for a few weeks this, this new season. They're going under the gate beautiful because they're going to prayer meeting. And I love it when friends go to prayer meeting together. We got it, by the way, 7 o'clock in the morning if you'd like to come early, 7 o'clock in the evening. 
Bring a friend with you. That's what prayer meeting's for. So Peter and John are hurrying because they're running just a little bit behind, but a professional beggar, because he's been lame for 40 years from birth, is sitting there, and his, instinctively his wrist goes out, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. Peter's about to hurry by when he hears that pitiful cry. He stops, and Peter locks his eyes on that lame man, and he uses words that raise huge expectation in that lame heart. Look at me. Look at me. Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I now give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk in that fisherman's hand comes down and grabs the bony wrist and somewhere between, halfway between down and up, two brand new legs. But what did Peter say? The exact opposite of God. Peter comes along and says, silver and gold have I what? None. God comes along, you have your Bible still open, have Haggai chapter 2 verse 8, put it on the screen again. God says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Silver and gold have I none, Peter confesses. Silver and gold have I all, God declares. It's all his. Look, if you're needing money, then who here isn't? If you're in trouble right now and you need some money, you need to know that what God has just spoken, that's our one-liner today, what God has just spoken is hugely great news for you. No matter what it is you're going through, if you're in trouble and you need this God, this God is saying, hey, hey, why all this anxiety? I have the gold. I have the silver. Don't worry, girl. Boy, don't worry. I have you covered. Just put your hand in mine. Put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the waters. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself, and you will look at others differently if you put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Remember that one? No. You have to be baby boomers to remember. <laughs> and that is the Jesus. Poor as a church mouse, by the way, Lord Jesus. Poorer than the widow who dropped in two mites. Jesus didn't have a coin on him one day when they wanted a little illustration. He had nothing. That's the Jesus who is God in disguise. And that's what God's talking about when he's talking about his house one day is going to have greater glory than the house has ever had. It's talking about Jesus. In fact, I want you to see that. Let's read verse 7 again. This is Haggai 2, verse 7. And I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations... Oh, we know who the desire of ages is, don't we? The one who is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Verse 9. And the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. I am the God of the angel armies. I am telling you, this is my house, and he's going to show up. <laughs> I mean, you look at the house right now. When God is speaking these words, it's a mess. They've been gone for 70 years. When Nebuchadnezzar came riding in with that raging, furious Babylonian horde, they took every man, woman, and child they could s still alive, captive, chain gang, their chain, winding through the desert to Babylon 70 years ago. And then comes a new king called Cyrus the Mede. He comes in, sets them, tells the religions of his empire, I have respect for your religion. The Holy Spirit has even mentioned Cyrus by name. So he's operating under divine instructions, and he tells the Jews, yo, go home. I want a band of you to go back, get the place ready. And so this intrepid band of exiles, Jews, they have come back. And there's good news, but I, I hate to tell you there's a little bit of bad news first, and that is God has been looking for them to coming back because he can hardly wait to renovate his house. He wants to get his house re-renovated again. They get back, and guess what they do? <laughs> they immediately start working on their own houses, and they are putting up some fine material. Yes, they are. And God is saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, time out. What's going on? And one author, by the way, calls what they were putting up mansions. 
Go back to chapter 1. Take a look at this. So, so here's the bad news. We'll get right back to the good news because God says in verse 2, this is what the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts says, these people say to me, Haggai, the exiles that came back with you, these people say to me, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. See, then the word of the Lord, verse 3, came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Talking about a rhetorical question. Verse 5, now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful attention, careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have you noticed you've harvested little? Harvested little? Hmm. You eat but never have enough? I wonder if something's going on here. You drink but never have your fill? You put on clothes but you're not warm? Must have lived in Michigan. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it? I had someone visit me in my office the other day, and while we were, I'm standing up in my office kind of moving around while I'm talking to this person, and I looked down, and I noticed a tic-tac on the floor. I said, oh, great. And I kept moving, and I noticed just more and more tic-tacs on the floor, and I didn't dare look down. I didn't dare lean over and say, let me pick these up. Excuse me just a minute. Obviously, I had a hole in my pocket, and the tic-tacs were just dripping out like crazy. How embarrassing. God says, you got purses. What's the problem with your purses? How come they're all leaking? You have no money left, do you? Oh. Verse 7, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up to the mountains. Bring down timber. Come on, guys. We're going to build my house so that I can take pleasure in it and be honored again. We're going to renovate my house. Do you understand? We got it, God. And that's exactly what the people do. That's the good news now. The bad news is over. Verse 13, the then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message to the Lord, from the Lord, rather, to the people. I'm with you, God says. I love this. I love this. You're moving to renovation. Tell, let, let me remind you, I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, that would be the governor of Judah, and Joshua, that would be the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. Now, get this, verse 15, very interesting. On the 24th day of the sixth month, may I tell you something? Guess what? Scholars and archaeologists have calculated that date, and I'm going to give it to you right now. No study guide today, so lock it in your mind. That date is September 21, 530 B.C. They begin to renovate the house of God. Now, you say, Dwight, how many years ago was that? Well, you take 2018 A.D. minus 530 B.C., and you get 2548. But then you crossed over from B.C. to A.D., so you, there's no zero. You, so you, you take one off. That's 2,547 years ago. Last month, they began to renovate the house of God. And here we are 2,547 years later about to do the same thing. Amazing. And by the way, God says, oh, yo, 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 don't worry, don't worry. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. I got you covered. Listen, that line, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, that's not a divine scolding. That's a divine promise that I'll take care of you. Wow. I'd say that's great news for this little campus church that like the band of exiles 2,547 years ago right now sets out to renovate the house of God. You know, when I think of the Pioneer Memorial Church, I love this church. And every time I come to Psalm 26, Psalm 26, verse 8, because I read the Psalms every day, cycle, so I'll come across it at least uh, two times a year. Every, every time I come to Psalm 26, uh, verse 8, I, I, in fact, I've scribbled in my margin, pioneer. Let me put Psalm 26, verse 8. Isn't this great? Hey, let's do this one out loud together. The psalmist is, is just in love, and you're going to see with what. Okay, let's read this out loud together. Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. Oh, God, I love your house. I'm going to tell you for this little pastor's art, those bricks, those bricks are not only sacred to me, and this timber, this place is precious. Sometimes I come in here all alone, middle of the night. This place is dark. I'll sit where you're sitting right now. And if you sit quietly enough in the middle of the night, I'm telling you, God is here. You can almost hear his voice in the darkness. Say, hey, 
I'm here. I'm so glad you came. And he'll talk to you. This is his house. It's not my house. He's always in this place. Wow. I love this place. I know you love it, too. Oh, I know you love it. Pioneer Memorial Church on the campus of Andrews University. And when you hear God, over, when we overhear God talking to the, the, the exiles come back and he says, hey, guys, what's the problem? I got a house. Don't you care about my house? Anybody here care about my house? When we overhear him say that, we know immediately God also loves this house. You love it, I love it. And through the miracle of what happens behind these lenses, do you know what? Hundreds of thousands of people keep coming to this house of God every single week all over the world. Brazil, glad you're here. Why? Because this house has become dear to them. I'm talking about our alums. When they graduate and go away, they still come back through that. It's not just me and you that love this place. There are people, when I travel across the nation, I have people come up to me and they say, yo, Pioneer Memorial Church, that's my church. I said, really? All over the world, that's my church. Oh, how I love. Put it on the screen again. Oh, Lord, how I love the house where you live the place where your glory dwells. I'm telling you what. So it's truly good news when God says to us, let me remind you, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Don't you worry. I have all the resources you need to fix this place up. I have all the resources you need to fix the leaking roof in your church. There used to be a cupola on top. That's called a steeple. You know where it is right now? It's parked right there, right outside that wall, in the, in the corner there because we had to go up there, rip the roof apart to patch just one hole. There are holes all over this place. It's still leaking. God says, I have enough resources to help you there. I have enough resources to help you with this shag carpet. You see, it's a shag carpet, though nobody intended it to be a shag carpet. What's up with that? God says, I can help you with this shag carpet. God says, I have the resources to help you with these hard wooden pews. For 60 years, people have been sitting hard on these hard wooden pews. How would you feel if you were a pew? <laughs> God says, I'll help you with that. And oh, by that sound system, <laughs> that sound system, let me tell you something. I have something. It does need work so that every ear in every pew can hear both voice and music with clarity no matter where you sit in this church. I'll talk about that in a moment. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. So I'm asking you returning exiles to help me repair and renovate my house of prayer for all people. And how did Haggai's people respond? One more line, verse, verse 12. Then Zerubbabel and Joshua and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared. They revered God and they said, God, you got it. Not our houses, it's your house that has front and center attention now. And that's why I'm excited this Sabbath, by the way, because our building committee has been working for a year and a half to make this beautiful brochure possible. Take it out, please. You were handed this. If you didn't get one, just put your hand up. We'll get some ushers. We'll get you this. You, this is a beautiful brochure. By the way, I want to thank Brittany Doyle, our graphics uh, designer. She worked with Troy Homanchuk who did the uh, architectural artwork. Just beautiful, beautiful. I'm so excited about this. Would you take it out right now? And I want you to notice, by the way, I'll put it on the cover for you. There you go. I want you to notice that, the, that this is called Renovate Heart and House. You see, we've been spending time all this new season with the heart. You remember at the, before the students even got here, we pulled this big sign down that says Renovate. Do you know how many faculty and staff are on that? They're covering that, those signatures, plus the freshmen. That's what we were focusing on. We want our hearts ready to become moral leaders on this campus. For, for weeks now, we've been talking about Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, the heart will be fine and you'll bear much fruit. But there comes a time, as God has just reminded us, when it's not just heart, there has to be house. Renovate heart 
and house, and now we move to house. You didn't get a brochure, just put your hand up. They're coming up and down the aisle for you. House. Wow. So, I, I, I want to, I, I feel very comfortable talking about this, by the way, on the Sabbath, because God did it first. He said, go get some wood for me. Let's talk about the plans for this house of mine. And he did it through, he was, he was in church. He's here in church right now. We're reading his words. I want to talk for a moment. Just, just, just think out loud with me for a moment. I remember the night when Kerry Carskellen, the chairman of, of our building committee, calculated the bottom line. So we're all sitting there. Okay, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? You see, the building committee hired a roofing engineer, a consultant. This guy does it for a living. He crawled all over this roof. Do you know that there are 36,700 square feet up there? It's eight-tenths of an acre, just the roof. Eight-tenths of an acre. And this is a very dangerous pitch. And he's taken pictures, 51 pictures he took. He put it into an, 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 an eight-page report. I've read the report. And when Kerry came to that bottom line, I must admit, I did what the Japanese do because I've grown up in Japan. I just sucked in there. Oh. A little over a million dollars. A million dollars. Oh, and that shag carpet, guys. We have to change the shag carpet. Okay. They added it. Put that picture of the, uh, there you go. So, so, so this is the artist now saying, look what it's going to be without a shag carpet. Look at those pews, by the way. They're padded. Are you serious? These pews are going to be padded now? Yeah, only the bottoms. Yeah. But the bottoms will be. And by the way, the ergonomic shape of this new pew, you're going to love it. It's cheaper, by the way, to replace the pews than to renovate the pews. And we're going to make wider aisles. Show me that next picture. We're going to make wider aisles so that a wheelchair can go rolling down the side. Two people can pass in the aisle. Now it's just one person and everybody going to... No more. We're going to, we're going to shorten the pews to make sure that there will be plenty of space. And I want you to keep looking at that because do you see... In the bottom picture, do you see something gray hanging down over the bricks in these blank brick spots? Guess what that is? The, the building committee hired audio engineers. They came in here and did a massive study on this large sanctuary that is the cause of sound waves bouncing around us and making voice and music sometimes difficult to understand. Our forefathers and fore, foremothers, when they brought forth this church 60 years ago this coming Valentine's Day, when they brought forth this church, they just were not prepared for the echo chamber. It's, people say, don't call it an echo chamber. Well, that's what's happening. There's reverb happening. The engineer said, you've got to slow that reverb way down, guys. It's too long. You've got to reduce the length of reverb. So those little padded curtains, electronic, just like HPAC, go back up again. We can control the sound in this space so that voice and music together become, un, become intelligible anywhere you sit. So, okay. And, and by the way, the audio engineer is saying, nice sound system, but you need a new one big time. So we've thrown that in as well. The lights. You can't even get the light bulbs to replace these lights. These are 60-year-old lights. Everything's gone LED. We're not LED. We want lights that would be, have real estate so you can control the lightness to, to, to a perfection. By the time you got to the bottom lines, Carrie says, all right, hit the, hit the total button. Two million dollars. Two million dollars. Wow, but I tell you what, the news gets even better. Hold on now. Because we already have, listen to this, we already have $352,111 cash on hand for this project to begin. We already have $3,352,000. And by the way, I visited with the president of the Michigan Conference, the new president, and he said, right, we're going to be helping you. You bet. I visited with the president of this university. I visited with the CFO. Both of them were in the first service. They both said, don't worry. We're going to be taking care of you. Because you know the university has something very beautiful over here called the Health and Wellness Center. And it's embarrassing, I'm sure, to have a church with a leaky roof right next to so beautiful a building. I mean, please, folks, don't go in that church. You'll get wet. Stay over in the health and wellness. The, the university doesn't want to do that. They said, no, come on. This is our church. This is our campus. We'll help you. God bless them. We talked to the treasurer of the Lake Union Conference, who's a member of this church, and he assures us that they will have a part in this project. So we are well on our way to renovate heart 
and house. In fact, may I tell you this? We already have, this is the best news of all, we already have the two million. Praise the Lord is right. You say, where is it, Dwight? It's in your pocket. <laughs> it's in your... <laughs> I that face went... <laughs> yeah, it's in your pocket. Not in all my pocket. No, but we put all our pockets together. Yeah, I told you, the news just keeps getting better. That's why the building committee and the church board voted last Monday night. Listen to this. They said, you know what? We're doing the whole thing this spring summer. We're doing the whole thing this spring summer. And by the new school year, there will be a new refurbished church to welcome the students back to Andrews University. What do you say to that? I say amen. I say amen. 60 years old. 60 years old. Valentine's Day, 1959. 60 years later will be Valentine's Day 2019. I say, let's give to God a $1 million cash birthday present for the Pioneer Memorial Church. It's His house. Why not? That's why, that's why, that's why I'm excited about this Sabbath and everything that this beautiful little brochure represents. So, okay. Oh, Lord, I love your house. Okay, Lord, let's just get this clear. I love the house where you live and the place where your glory dwells, which means the question deserves to be asked, yo, Dwight, how much are you going to do? Hmm? Dwight, I'm talking to you. How much are you going to do? And the question reverberates in your own mind. I wonder how much I should do to renovate God's house at Pioneer. Karen and I came back from uh, Hong Kong this summer in July, preaching mission. We got back at our house. I'm telling you, we opened the door. Oven, humid, hot. What's wrong with our air conditioning? Called a reputable firm up in St. Joseph. They sent a rep out. He, he says, I hate to tell you, but this, this uh, outdoor AC thing is dead. It's gone. And by the way, he said, I was just looking at your electric furnace. <laughs> That thing, 40 years old, it's on its last legs. You need to replace that. And might I suggest gas? And I said to him, okay, so what would the bottom line be? And he showed it to me. Are you serious? I said, we need some time to talk. So Karen and I got alone together. We huddled up, didn't we? We huddled up and we said, what can we, what can we do? But you know what? If you do some half-baked concoction... You're not going to be happy with that. It's going to break all over again. You're going to have to either do this right or don't do it at all. And that's what we decided. And so you know what we had to do? Into our hard-earned, carefully protected life savings, we withdrew the amount to make our house livable again. God comes to the friends of Haggai and he says, hey, guys, I'm just saying I need you to do the same thing for my house. And so logically thinking, I mean, why, why couldn't I? Why couldn't I decide to be just as quick to draw out money in order to, if I pay for my own home, why couldn't I be just as resolute to draw out money from hard-earned savings to repair God's house? I mean, I'm not going to if, if it were my house and it were leaking, you think I'm going to say, hey, Karen, get some, go to Walmart, get some more buckets. We can do this. Just string them out here. Who cares? Just use buckets. I... The chairman of the board of Andrews University, Arthur Stella, was preaching last November for Reformation Sabbath. He's preaching his heart out. I'm sitting right there in second service, and we have this humongous thunderstorm come over. And while he's preaching, there are deacons tiptoeing out, putting buckets all along. And I'm thinking, Arthur, don't look back. Just don't look back. Don't worry about it. We got it. And I am sliding lower and lower. It's embarrassing. You don't leave a leak. You fix it if you value the house. Oh, okay. Oh, by the way, God says, uh, did I tell you I'm going to take care of you? Because all the silver is mine and all the gold is mine. And by the way, just relax. God is not talking about equal gifts. Mm -mm. He's talking about equal sacrifice. We can't all give the same. Are you kidding? But we can all sacrifice the same. 
Because you know what? My sacrifice is not determined by the amount I give. Rather, it's determined by the amount I have left over after my gift has been given. That's how you tell whether it's sacrifice or not. Which is why Jesus could look down at that cof those coffers of offerings and say, that little woman who gave all her two little mites, she's given more than everybody today because she had nothing left. And the God of the universe in human flesh said, I see that. That woman with her two mites has raised money in the trillions ever since. He took her sacrificial act and by his stage whisper proclaimed it to the universe. And we all know the story. And if she can do it, what can I do for you, Jesus? Wow. So anyway, your pastors, two Mondays ago, we huddled around our little table. We're short two pastors, okay? So we're short. We're hiring them. But we're short right now. We sat around this round table where we meet, and we asked ourselves, how much are we, we willing to give to the Renovate Heart and House Project? After all, leaders lead the way. Leaders don't follow. Leaders are ahead saying, come on, I believe in this. So we... So Everybody went home with this little envelope like you have right now. Everybody, all the pastors go home with it, okay? Everybody in our staff. We spend the week talking to our family. We spend the week talking to God. And we came back with this envelope sealed. We wrote an amount on this envelope. I didn't know. I don't know. But we gave, we put all the envelopes in the middle of the table. We put our hands on top of them and we said, God, this is awfully humble. I know. But please, would you use this as seed for your kingdom? We took the envelopes. I gave them to Joanne, our church uh, accountant slash treasurer. I said, Joanne, give me the total by the end of the afternoon, please. She handed me a little yellow post-it slip, and on that post-it slip were these numbers, $45,510. A bunch of pastors. Are you serious? Tears just came into my eyes. That night, I shared that number to our church Board. These are the leaders of the Pioneer Memorial Church. I shared that number. I sent the, we, we sent the envelope home with, with all the leaders. And if you're going to be around this week and you're not traveling, drop by the church office with the envelope, if you wish, by Friday. Twelve families dropped by by noon yesterday when the doors closed. Joanne gave me another little yellow Post-it note. And it read $64,600. When you add up those humble little pledges, $110,110. Wow. What, am I bragging about this? Are you kidding? I'm just telling you that nobody's asking you to do what your leaders are not already doing. They're going out on a limb with God because God says the silver is mine. Don't you worry. The gold is mine. Don't be anxious. I'll take care of you. This is my house. I'll honor, I'll honor that. Do you know what? If you take $110,110 and you put it with, with the, the 352, we're short of a half a million dollars already. Already. As a bottom line. So we're appealing to you today to consider that bottom line as well. It's God's house which you worship in. We are privileged to worship together in. Take this little envelope out, Come on. Come, do you mind just pulling it out? It's just two sentences on it. Just two sentences. This isn't, this isn't signing your life away. This isn't taking fingerprints. This is just a pledge. Notice how it begins. Pull it out. By the grace of God. All right? So if my life just keeps continuing as it is, and by the way, these are all over three years. It's over three years. By the grace of God, I slash we want to participate in making a sacrificial offering to Pioneer's Renovate Heart and House campaign. Here is my slash our prayerful pledge of support total over three years for Pioneer's Renovation Project. That's it. You put a little number and bring this back next Sabbath. Let's just have, we won't know what's on it. Nobody will know. But we'll just, we, we will have a, a, a joyous celebration before God that he has called us to join with him in renovating his favorite house on this campus. Why not? Hey, Ellen White, 100 years ago, on the screen, 
everything God could do has, was done to save a perishing world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Keep reading. God has made it impossible for it to be said that he could have done more than he has done for you and me and the fallen race. When he gave us his son, oh, I love this, he gave himself in one great gift. He poured out the whole treasure of heaven. The last line is, is the choice one. He has revealed a love that defies all computation, a love that should fill our hearts and lives with gratitude. He says, you can't crunch the numbers. Get the adding machine going. Let's find out how much God has really done for us. You can't do it. It defies all computation. The silver is mine. The gold is mine. Yo, I'll take care of you. That's my point. I'll take care of you. I need you to help me fix my house, please. Just look at Calvary. Crunch the numbers at the foot of the cross. Just for me, he was willing to go through empty his treasury. Wow. So... Oh, come on, Dwight, I'm a college student. Don't even talk to me about giving. Oh, you're right. Don't give unless you'd be willing to do this. Here's the deal. You're a college student. Oh, Dwight, I'm a, I'm a graduate student here. We just saw a beautiful little family, the Gomez family. I'm a graduate student. Do you know how tight it is for a graduate student? I understand. I was a graduate student here. here here's the deal for you. One pizza a week, medium size. You go without. $10 a week. If you go without one pizza a week and give that $10 to God himself, that's 10, so that's four times, that's $40 a month, that's $480 a year, and it's only three years, that would be $1,440, $1,440. You will have quietly been investing in this house of God as a student on the campus of Andrews University. Yeah, but Dwight, I don't use checks and I don't use tithe envelopes. Oh, good. Well, we're ready for that. Would you put on the screen, please, the brand new, this just came out, the Adventist Giving app. I just downloaded it yesterday. (laughs) Go to your store. Go to your app store. You'll get it. It's so simple. And renovate. When you type in Pioneer, they'll ask you, pick the church because it it reads your where your location, and it'll give you one of the choices in town, and it'll be Pioneer. Just tap on that. You got the rest. Line number three is renovate. $10 a week. From your debit card. Your debit card will not even feel it. <laughs> Given the way you spend it, Best Buy. Ten, ten, ten. <laughs> you say, Dwight, I'm not into apps. I really don't like apps. Okay, you're watching an app, and we have live streamers who are online with us right now. You know what? I'm going to put it on the screen. You're going to see it pop in front of your your, uh, laptop right now. You see that that website that just went up yesterday, pmchurch.org slash renovate. Anywhere in the world, just go to that. You'll have this whole booklet summarized. You'll get the booklet. And when it drops down, you'll see donate. Click donate. You can donate whatever you wish. And if you're an alum, if you're an alum from Andrews University, we'd love to have you be a part of helping your old church when you were here. Why not? It's God's house. And he needs you. He said, right, I'm not into this electronic stuff. Okay, tithe envelope. You come next Sabbath, there'll be a line on the tithe envelope. Renovate. Do it the old-fashioned way. It's the way I do it. Turn the tithe envelope in. Tithe envelope in. And by, 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 the, by the way, hold on, hold on, hold on. Nobody's giving gifts. We're not asking for anything next Sabbath. Next Sabbath is just this. There's no cash in this. We won't be looking inside. Is there any? No, this is it. Bring this back next Sabbath and with joy before God. Let's stand and let's sing the doxology of what God has done. And I believe because I know God and I know you that this church will rise up 125th of our operating income a year. Personally, we can do it. Piece of cake through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not equal giving, but equal sacrifice. Yeah, next Sabbath. Oh, by the way, come Tuesday night. Tuesday night over there in the youth chapel, Carrie Carskellen, the chair of our building committee, Pastor Jose, who chairs our Renovate campaign, AdCom team, they'll be here. There'll be some materials. You can get up close and check it out. Ask any question you wish. 7 o'clock next Tuesday. Then next Sabbath we come. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, as the Scripture sings. 
He's able. God will bless you. I know. Let me end by telling you that a few years ago, Madeline Johnston, one of our faculty here, retired now, but this is years ago. She told me about when their little daughter, when their daughter Elizabeth was a little tyke and she went to Sabbath school and she learned her Sabbath school lesson. God loves a cheerful giver. That would be 2 Corinthians 9. All right? God loves a cheerful giver. Do you get that, Elizabeth? I get it. God loves a cheerful giver. So all week long, she's repeating, she's reciting the, the uh, memory verse, God loves a cheerful giver. But one morning when Madeline went by little Elizabeth's bedroom, she heard her, and instead of saying God loves a cheerful giver, she, was, she got a little confused, and she was saying God is a lovely, cheerful giver. God is a lovely, cheerful giver. You know what? The girl got it right. He's right, Paul. God loves a cheerful giver. But I say next Sabbath, let's bring, let's bring these little envelopes to the God who is a lovely, cheerful giver. The gold is mine. The silver is mine. Don't you fret. I've got you covered. Amen. I want to take an extra moment to thank you for joining us in worship today. It's by the continued support from viewers like you that we're able to bring you this program. Today I want to invite you, though, to share with us how this ministry has blessed you. I get inspiring notes, emails from viewers literally all over the world telling me, look, Dwight, God has been blessing me this way. He's been doing this. I would love to hear from you as well. Just visit our website, you know it, newperceptions.tv, and click on the contact link at the top of the page. Send me a note. Let me know what God has been doing right now in your life. Once again, thank you for being with us today. I hope you'll join us right here next time. And until then, may the God of grace journey with you every step of the way.